Coming up next on TCM, an exclusive interview from the world of cinema in Offset. Filmmaking is always difficult. Um, I mean, to have the opportunity of working with somebody like Stanley Kubrick, it, it's, it, it, I, if I were a scientist, it'd be like having the opportunity to spend a couple of years with Albert Einstein in the laboratory. Um, that it's just, I, I do believe that, that, that there's, you know, there's birth and death and everything in between, that it's not, it, you know, it's divided by days and months and years, but really, when you look at it, it's, it's a life. Um, and it's, life is better to be measured by experience than by days and months and years. And so the experience of working with Stanley Kubrick is indelible. And it, while it's difficult and painful, you know, at times, the, the, the reward of, of working with some, someone like Stanley Kubrick and the people that Stanley Kubrick worked, had working with him, Michael Hare, you know, who arguably wrote one of the best war movie books ever, I mean, war books ever. He wrote the, the, the voiceover in Apocalypse Now. His book, Dispatches, uh, gives you an understanding and, a, and an empathy for American soldiers, not American soldiers, for the Vietnamese, for, for people in war, that, that's beyond anything I've ever read. Um, um, you know, Anton First, the production designer, Leon Vitale, who, who was his assistant, who acted in Barry Lyndon, who was the boy, the petulant boy who shoots Ryan O'Neill. And he worked with the boy in uh, The Shining. He worked with Lee Ermey, you know, to help him with his acting chops, because Lee Ermey wasn't really an actor, you know, he, he, but he's a great actor. I mean, but, but Lee, Lee, I mean, Leon Vitale worked with him endlessly to help him to give the performance that he gives in Full Metal Jacket. Um, uh, you know, and, and Leon is a life friend, you know, uh, his family, the, the Kubrick family. Um, you know, th those, those are all things that are all, you know, icing on the cake, you know. I was quite <clears throat> terrified to, to, uh, to meet him. And then I, I, when I did, I, I, I was flabbergasted because he wasn't any of those things. He was just this kind of, um, not f fat, but jolly. <laughs> um, man with a beard and uh, it, it, you know you walked into the house and there's this huge kitchen which is where the family lived uh, around food you know around the around the, the kitchen where his wife painted where his kids you know grew up drawing pictures and painting and doing their music lessons and um, he was everything completely opposite of what his legend was and I think he was really comfortable with that kind of misperception because it kept people away from him you know, the, the, the more, eccentricity, uh, more eccentricities that people believe that he had, the better for him. Because it just meant that he'd be able to live that much more privately and be able to concentrate on what, what it was that he did, which was uh, his love of making movies. Um, one of the best film documentaries I've ever seen is The Making of The Shining that, that his daughter Vivian made. Um, it's a brilliant documentary. And, uh, you know, Stanley was certainly in control of that documentary and allowed the documentary to show him in a rather unflattering uh, light, that, that he, he didn't spare himself. I mean, you, you see Shelley Duvall going through the difficulties that she was going through as an actress, and Jack Nicholson preparing for his role in, I mean, you know, one of his, I mean, greatly frightening, comedic roles I've ever seen in film. Um, uh, but, but, but you see Stanley Kubrick quite hard and quite vicious, you know, and, and, and honest, though, you know. That if, if I were to describe Stanley Kubrick, I think the easiest way, because we've all seen The Wizard of Oz, that, that the perception that Stanley wanted the world to see him as, the, per, the, 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 the visage, visage, I don't know, was that word? Uh, if I was French, I'd know how to say it. Uh, V-I-S-A-G-E. Um, is that image of the powerful Oz, the first time that we see him, with that, you know, the smoking and the big booming voice and scaring the hell out of Dorothy and the scarecrow and the lion and the tin man. And Toto, the little dog who doesn't care, you know, runs down to a curtain where there's some movement and pulls the curtain open and reveals this guy manipulating 
his image. You know, speaking into a thing and giving himself a big booming voice and uh, projecting himself larger than life. But he was really just this happy, jolly man uh, who was vulnerable and, and, and soft like all of us, you know. I mean, it absolutely could be very difficult, be, uh, you know, but, but it was only because of his passion for his work. You know, I mean, not any more difficult than, than Robert Altman or Alan Parker or um, John Schlesinger. You know, I mean, that it's a difficult job making movies. You know, you've got, you've got hundreds of people that are working for you. Um, there's so many things that can go wrong. that So you're always a, a constant battle trying to keep, you know, fingers and dikes that are leaking, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and to keep, you know, the ship on course so that, because there's a, there's a lot of storms that happen when you're making movies, and, and it, it's, uh, it, it's, very, it's very difficult. I mean, the, in the case of Full Metal Jacket, it's just, it's difficulty stretched out over, uh, over a much longer period of time. Usually that is, uh, you know, films are made within two to three, sometimes four months. And so because this was, was elongated and stretched out to a period of a year and a half, I mean, almost two, two years, I, I don't remember exactly what it is. I should, but um, it was a long time. I think I don't want to know. I don't want to remember how much, how much a period of my life it was. But, um, you know, the, the thing about my, my diary, Full Metal Jacket Diary, is... Um, it's a diary that was kept at that time. It's not, it's not revisionist. It's not looking back on it. Because if I look back and wrote it today, I think it would be much more romantic. It would be much more uh, forgiving. Um, and, and so the, the, the diary, because it, it shows the day-to-day -day difficulties and the day-to-day -day frustrations, that um, my fear that I'm failing, that, that I'm not giving Stanley Kubrick what it is that he wants and what he needs, um, and, and taking that on myself and, and, and feeling that I've disappointed him. Or, or, and, and then, the, you know, the, for all of the frustrations that start to surround me with my personal life, of my, my wife being pregnant and, and our having our first baby and this emergency cesarean that's going to take place and, um, and Stanley not wanting to let me go to the hospital out of practical, not, not because he wanted to be cruel, but he was a very practical man. And, and that, like, honestly, and, and, and fair enough, what am I going to do in the hospital except hold my wife's head, you know, and be there with her while she's having this emergency cesarean? I mean, from his point of view, um, a, a husband going into the room is just going to be in the way of the doctor. Uh, his, his father was a doctor, so maybe he had some kind of practical understanding of that. But really, honestly, what was I going to do? I might probably get sick and pass out and fall on the floor, and then the doctor's going to have to take care of me, and then he's going to get messed up because I can't come back to work because I hit my head on the floor and had to get stitched up. Um, so from a very practical point of view, he didn't understand at all why I would want to go to the hospital and be with my wife while she was having this emergency cesarean. It, emotions are what drive us, you know, but they're, they're not practical. Mm. I mean, this is a man who's, who spent years trying to make the movie Napoleon, um, who was uh, made decision driven by, I mean, the mistakes that Napoleon made were, were based on emotion. That when, when Napoleon was, was uh, strategic and, and, and thoughtful and, and made tactical decisions, he did well. But finally what did Napoleon was, you know, emotions. And, and that's what does most of us in, you know, mm -hmm. is that we make em emotional decisions rather than practical decisions. I've spent my career making emotional decisions. If I made practical decisions, I'd be, uh, I'd be a, a, a much bigger movie star with a with a wallet that I couldn't sit on because it was so <laughs> full of money. But I'm driven by my emotions, and, and they're impractical. It makes sense to me that Stanley Kubrick would love playing the game of chess rather than a game of poker, because a poker is something that you're dealt a hand, where in chess you can manipulate the game, you can, you can attack, you can retreat, but it's a, it's a game of strategy, it's a mental game. When you start playing chess emotionally, you lose. You know, you're going you're gonna, to try to take something and get drawn into a trap, you know, by taking, you know, by moving foolishly. But in a game of, of, of poker, which I think is much more about life, is that it's not the cards that you're dealt, it's how you play them. Mm. It's a bluff, you know, so, so I, I, I play poker and Stanley plays chess. <laughs> <laughs> the, the antagonism that, that grew between Vincent and I 
um, was very much, because we both met when we were auditioning for another film, and he was studying with somebody from Lee Strasberg School, and I was studying at Stella Adler. Now, the, dip, the basic difference between those two schools of acting is Stella works from your imagination, and Lee Strasberg works from kind of personal experience and, and putting yourself through an experience, which I think when you're working it with your imagination, you can't help but put yourself into the experience because just because you're going to be imagining it, you're going to start doing it. So they're, they're similar things, but they're different. Mm -hmm. and, and for Vincent, um, it was very important for him to, to enter into a world that nobody else could come into. And there, this antagonism, this, this, this rivalry that, that, that arose between the two of us, um, uh, I think that, I don't know that the film would be better or if, if the performance would have been worse had he not done that. But I know that the, the relationship between the two of us, that there's electricity between those two people. So all those times when I'm coming over to Vincent, buttoning his shirt or making his bed or taking the, the bar of soap and beating him in the bed, um, Vincent and I, they, it, we, it, I, we wanted to kill each other. So when he's looking at me with that big stupid face and going, hey, Joker, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm telling him, you know, you, you, you got to learn how to make your bed. You got to, you know, fix yourself up, teaching him the, how, to, how to work his rifle and stuff like that. Um, there, there's a real energy between the two of us. It's not two people who are pl playing something, we, two people who are really, really quite viciously angry with each other. But it was great. And now we're really good friends and who, you know, it's all, it, I think that what Vince would argue is that, look, we did a good job and it's great. And isn't it great that we can continue to be friends? It's a moral responsibility to, to take another person's life. And I made the decision that I wanted to try to splash blood on the audience. That, 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 that the, the idea, I mean, we see so many films where people shoot people and kill people and, and, and you know, they're the hero and they, they killed the bad guy. Well, this is the bad guy. I'm standing over this young girl who's just killed, you know, Two people, well, three people, Cowboy, uh, uh, Eight Ball, and Doc J. She just killed three people. And now I'm standing over this person and, and who's begging me t to take her life, um, who's just killed three of my men and, and now is bleeding to death and, and, and suffering. And I, I, I don't feel like I can leave her, just leave her there suffering and, and, and that we have to do something. And you know, an animal mother, Adam Baldwin's character says, you want to waste her, waste her. And, and the private Joker was supposed to die in the film. He was supposed to die. And this was a, a big, in the diary I talk about it, um, that, that Stanley Kubrick and I kept struggling with. Like, what, what, how, how should the film end? And, and finally, out of tremendous anger and frustration, Stanley asked me again, have you been thinking about, it, about the end of the film? And I, I said, yeah, I have. I think Joker should live. That he should go through boot, boot camp and see his drill instructor get shot. That this, this guy that he tried to help get through boot camp should take his own life and blow his brains all over the bathroom. That he should come to Vietnam and the one guy that he'd gone through boot camp with should die in his arms. That, that he should see these other soldiers get killed. And that, that he should stand over this girl and, and, and kill her. And by killing her, he something in himself dies. That the Joker should should live, because that, that's the real death. Is that that for all of the soldiers who fought in the Second World War, in the Korean War, in this war that we're fighting now in Vietnam, that that's the real horror. Is to have to spend the rest of your life thinking about the things that you saw and 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 reliving the things that you did. That that's the horror of war. That I mean, it's almost merciful. To, to go and experience and see those kind of things and, and have your life taken. But to, you know, to have to spend the rest of your life and, and have your head lying on the pillow at the end of your life thinking about the things that you did, that that's the horror. That's the real horror of war.